So I'll do a soft open and then I'll turn it over to you and introduce okay. you. Okay. All right. Sounds great. I just totally had a pregnancy brain fart. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are rolling into another episode of the Candace Owens show. So I've noticed this thing recently. Um, I live in Washington, D.C., and every time I get into an Uber car, the Uber driver happens to be an immigrant from Africa, and they are all conservative. Every last single one of these African immigrants is conservative. And they usually recognize me and they start a conversation with me about black Americans. And the conversation usually ends with them asking, what is wrong with black Americans? How could black Americans possibly view themselves as oppressed? And I often think this as well. Maybe the problem with black Americans is that we have actually no connection uh, to the continent of Africa. And at the same time that we are squealing that we've been taken from our homeland, we have no idea what actually goes on um, in Africa. I'm very excited about having this next guest because she is an immigrant from Africa and she's lived in America for a very long time. And there is so much for us to delve in here, so much to learn from African immigrants. And I hope that all Americans, but especially Black Americans, listen to this episode. Melissa Tate. Welcome to The Candace Owens Show. Thank you so much for having me, Candace. So I do want to give the audience a background. You actually have a very big Twitter profile as well. You are mm -hmm. at The Right Melissa. Yes. And I remember when I was getting started and kind of looking at what conservatives were black, um, you were one of the accounts that I followed right away. Right. And I had no idea um, that you spent the first 17 years 19, of your life, 19, 19 years, years of your life yes. in Africa. You do not have an accent. So I still, when you told me this the other day, I was like, what? Um, and you're from, of all places, Zimbabwe. Yes. Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. where Robert Mugabe uh, was the prime minister. I wrote down the dates from 1980 to 1987 uh, before he became the president in 1987. Uh, and that ended in 2017. And there is no better person to talk about uh, when you're talking about the harms of socialism and how swift it can happen uh, than Robert Mugabe. So I just want to start with um, what was what was it like when you grew up in Africa? Okay, so basically, uh, you know, growing up in Africa, my story begins in a small town in uh, a, a small town called Rusape. And there I grew up as a, you know, just a young kid that loved living in uh, Zimbabwe. My mother later moved to a, the bigger city, which is Harare. And Harare is a beautiful, uh, was a beautiful city, very cosmopolitan. You know, there were people from all over the world because it's such an amazing city. It was uh, very cosmopolitan and there was a lot of um, great weather. So when I went to school, I went to school with people from all over the world. I went to school with people from Australia, from Sweden, from Denmark, you name it. So it was amazing growing up in Zimbabwe because starting off, it was very uh, capitalist. So when Mugabe came into power, he, w he didn't start off being a Marxist. You know, it was slow walked. So it was over a 20 year period that he started implementing socialist um, socialist policies that then transformed Zimbabwe. But beginning there, it was amazing. It used to be called the breadbasket of Africa. Absolutely. It was a very wealthy country. Uh, even people from neighboring countries, neighboring African countries, used to come to Zimbabwe to migrate there for a better life. So I couldn't have asked to live in a in any other place in the world, but to grow up in Zimbabwe. It was very peaceful. You know, I used to walk to school, you know, walk back from school like miles and not have to worry about being kidnapped or anything like that. It was just a beautiful, peaceful country. And you have family in Zimbabwe today? Yes, I do. My mother lives there. And is your mother still lives there? Yes. Yeah. And is your mother still growing up in that peaceful, beautiful country? Absolutely not. Right now it has transformed into something else. Uh, with the passing of uh, President Mugabe, we now have a new president who is probably, if it's possible, worse than Mugabe as well, because he's also a, a serious Marxist. He, there's a lot of Chinese influence that has taken place in Zimbabwe. I would actually call it more like colonization by the Chinese. And it's absolutely terrible what's taking place there. 
So when Robert Mugabe gets elected, what is his rhetoric? How are we starting? It's a great place. Everyone's happy to live here. We're called the breadbasket of Africa. And I know that he started efforts, um, expropriation efforts. And it was what, what was his rhetoric? How did this begin, this sort of well, socialist Marxist? So to begin with, he was, uh, he was all about reconciliation with the white community because there is quite a significant white population in Zimbabwe. So his rhetoric started out of, uh, as reconciliation with the whites. So when I was growing up in Zimbabwe, there was no racial tension like, you know, animosity. It was all about reconciliation and everybody moving forward away from the past of colonization. Mm -hmm. So that's how he started out. But as time went by, the corruption that he had uh, that he had instituted within the country, the min his ministers were stealing millions of dollars from the people, and uh, his war veterans they blew all the pension funds. So now what was taking place was the economy was starting to fail, and his way of uh, taking attention off himself was to start this Marxist rhetoric against the white farmers. Mm. So he started telling everybody that your problem is not me and my corrupt ministers. Your problem are the white farmers. They're the ones that have taken your land and this is your land. So you are the, that's who you should be looking at and not me. Oh, so this so, is so playbook socialist. Exactly. It's actually, the government is corrupt. The government is taking your money. But let me go ahead and start issues between the proletariat um, exactly. and the wealthy people. And that's what I start to see in the United States. And that's why it's so familiar to me. I'm just like, wow, OK, this is starting to play out again. Yeah, actually, right when you were just saying that in the beginning, it was, oh, we need reconciliation. We need to move forward. I instantly thought of Obama. Right. Because that was sort of like that was the guy. I That's remember how crying the night that he won, being like, finally, we're all going to come together. We're going to move forward. Exactly. And not exactly what we got. Absolutely not. The same way his rhetoric started changing, Obama's rhetoric started changing and becoming more about black versus white. That's so did the, the people same. of Zimbabwe fall for this rhetoric? Well, a lot of the people in the rural areas did. So what happened was uh, a lot of the war veterans that had lost their pension funds, they started seizing the white farmers land by force and killing some of the white farmers. So it created a lot of tension within the country, but it was mostly rural. So we never really felt it in the city. Mm -hmm. So in the rural areas that was taking place. And then once, um, once that had taken place, it started creating a cascading effect because now uh, there were sanctions placed on Zimbabwe, and it just went into overdrive. So uh, just the policies that were being implemented, you know, they all sounded great. It was like indigenization, mm. you know, giving the land to the people. But it never really went to the people of Zimbabwe. It went to his cronies. Right. It went to the ministers and all these. And they were building mansions that looked like office buildings. Right. You know, and they were living like that while the rest of the population was living in abject poverty. I mean— um, Unemployment went to 80%, if you can even imagine that. I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. The uh, inflation rate was, uh, it started out at 7,000% inflation rate, and then it went to 250 million percent inflation. I don't so I can't comprehend. <laughs> I, I, I do not have the mathematics skills to comprehend that. I got to, <laughs> an inflation rate of 250 million. 250 million. So he comes and he says, his, his cronies, he's got his ministers, they're doing bad stuff, and people are going, hey, what's going on? And his, his effort is to say, white people. White Look people. at these white people. They've got your land, and we've got to expropriate it and take it away from them. And of yes. course, if you're a citizen, you're going, maybe that's it. Maybe that is the issue. Right. We need to take this, take this land away from them. Exactly. And of course, the irony uh, of the Mugabe story is that it doesn't really work that way. Expropriation effort is something that we're starting to hear a lot of that rhetoric um, you know, South Africa also has this issue as well. So Here's Africa's the thing. Taking back farms, um, if you don't know how to manage a farm, those farms collapse. Exactly. And that's exactly what happened right. in Zimbabwe, Candace, because what happened was he was giving land to people that have no background in farming. commercial farming. You know, a lot of them were sub subsistence farmers. They were not commercial farmers. So he was giving them land. And then what happened was production because Zimbabwe was well known as an agricultural you know, that was our main export was agriculture. So we're talking tobacco, we're talking flowers, you know, like Zimbabwe was providing flowers to, to Europe. You know, there were planes that were flying out of Zimbabwe to Europe every single day with flowers. You know, so this was what was bringing money into the country and it was creating jobs. So all those things started to fall apart because what happened was 
those farms, uh, you know, because they were seized, the production of, of all these uh, tobacco and flowers and all, it went down by like 40, 50, 60 percent until it came to a point where, you know, Zimbabwe was not even making enough money to sustain itself. Yeah. And it just started to collapse and crumble. So you're looking at people who have like, um, you know, like, for example, my mother, you know, she had invested, you know, let's say, for example, like in a 401k, she invested, she had like an equivalent of what would be like, let's say $200,000. And then she wakes up one morning and finds out that her $200,000 can buy you a chicken at the grocery store. Oh and goodness. that's what we lived through. And um, I remember we used to sit in fuel queues. Uh, you would go into the supermarket and there was nothing on the shelf because Mugabe was trying to put price controls on the food. So, um, you know, when you put price controls, people are not going to, you know, engage in that because it, let's say you're a farmer or you sell chicken or whatever. And then the government says that you're supposed to sell your chicken at five dollars, but it costs you about six dollars to make it. So you're not going to put your chicken in there. So he created a black market of food. So you 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 had a chicken dealer, you had a bread dealer, you had <laughs> yeah, so it was crazy. Yeah, it was egg crazy. Egg dealer and, and all eggs. Of this, yeah. yeah. Basic things. You would walk into the supermarket and there was absolutely nothing on the shelves. So let me ask you something. When you hear now and especially in, in California, I think they're leading the charge on this, uh we're gonna put together a committee and that California is getting real close to, you know, socialism, you know, Absolutely. we're going to put together a committee to talk about reparations. Do you hear when you hear that, like, government is corrupt, government is running out of other people's money. And now what we're going to do is we're going to start to pretend that it's the white man's fault or it's because of 400 years of slavery. And that's what it is. When I look at reparations, to me, it sounds like the the land reform program that we had in Zimbabwe. You're talking about you know, taking money from other people and giving it to uh, other people to right a wrong from the past. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe in that. I believe in moving forward. And if you just take money, you know, let, let's say we're going to give you $100,000, you know, from in reparations, you're going to blow through that money within a couple of years if you don't know how to invest, how to use it and whatnot. So I, I, I don't believe in reparations. I just think it's ridiculous because yeah. if you really think about it, who lives? Who 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 alive today has lived through slavery? Certainly not I. Who alive That's, today has had a slave in America? Right, exactly. And when I actually studied it, I was shocked to find out that only two percent of the white people that are alive today in the United States uh, own slaves. And certain states like Kansas, you know where I'm from, Kansas and Missouri, Kansas never had slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain uh, states that never had slaves. Right. So, I think it was even less than 2% at the time of the Civil War of people that actually had slaves. And pe people don't re realize that it was the extremely wealthy people. I mean, you're talking about what today would be the Jeff Bezos of the world that could afford absolutely. to have slaves. And yet they see, and this is even when they attack Confederate soldiers and when they need to wipe this away, those people didn't have slaves. It's, it was a poor man's fight and a rich man's war, the Civil War. And, and, and it's because of this lack of education about what this war was a fight. They weren't fighting to maintain slavery. They didn't have slaves. Right. <laughs> All these people that were fighting, they didn't have any slaves. Exactly. Um, and and it's, it's so, as we're seeing increasingly now, especially with critical race theory and this focus on race, it is a bit of look over here, look over here, right. because we don't want you looking to see what we're actually doing over here. Exactly. And we're trying to grow government, and we want to get all of our cronies in there like Mugabe did. Exactly. And we want to take, 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 take while telling you that the that, reason you're suffering is because of the white man and, exactly. and, and the injustice that were done centuries ago. Exactly. It's scary. It really is scary. It's scary to watch because I've lived through it. Right. I've seen it. I've seen the playbook. And now I'm seeing it play out, you know, and I just listened to the Democrat Party. I'm like, I've watched this show before. Oh, that is so, yeah. so scary. Right. So what was it like for your mother? I just went with that because I just am thinking you have $200,000 saved in a bank account and then you wake up one day and you find out, you know, very quickly that that $200,000 can get you chicken, maybe some eggs. Yes. Uh, what, what was it like for her? It was very difficult. It was very difficult. But, you know, um, the thing is, Zimbabwean people are very resilient mm -hmm. and they're actually very, um, they're just naturally funny people. So there was a lot of, I guess you would call them memes now, but back then <laughs> there was no memes, but there was just a lot of uh, jokes that surrounded, you know, people get over things with, with, uh, through uh, comedy, you know, so, um, so there was a lot of um, pain 
that a lot of people went through, you know, just losing everything. And the only thing that survived out of everything my mom had invested in was the physical real estate that she owned. Mm. And that's the only thing that survived everything, her pension funds, her for her equivalent of a 401k, her life insurance, all that stuff went away wow. overnight. So it was very difficult. So let me ask you, how did you get out? How, how did you end up in America? Okay, so... Um, 19 years old, country's nine, falling apart. How nine, did you get here? So um, in Zimbabwe, we only have about two universities, like major universities. So it's very hard to get in because you have to be a genius and... I'm smart, but I'm not a genius. So uh, typically what happens is um, people who are middle class, they send their kids abroad to study. So it's very okay. typical of a middle class family to send their kids to study abroad. So a lot of people go to South Africa, they go to the United Kingdom, they go to Australia and the United States. And because I had come here before when I was 17 for a missions trip, I went to California and uh, Florida. What is a missions trip? A mission, a yeah. m- like mission, like yeah, with mission my church. Trip. What you, yeah. With your church. Okay, with my church, okay. yeah. So I had come uh, was when I was, yeah, when I was about 16 years old, I had come here and we went to Disney World and Disneyland. So when when, when it came time for me to go to college, I was like, I'm going to America. <laughs> so, so that's how it all started. And uh, my mom, at this time, all this is playing out. You know, the economy is crashing. The dollar, the Zimbabwean dollar is crashing against the the American dollar. So my mom couldn't afford to send me to the United States for school. But because my mom is a woman of faith, she said, by faith, you're going to go. So she uh, actually had like a fundraiser to raise money for my ticket to go to Zim- uh, to come to the United States. I applied to, in fact, I was applying to a lot of universities on the East Coast, but it wasn't going anywhere. And almost a year a year into applying to all these universities, I started to give up hope until this lady came up with one application. She's like, just try this one. This school seems to be very responsive in my experience, so just try this last one. And it was an application to the University of Missouri, Kansas City. So I was like, I will sign it. I will do that. You know, I didn't know the difference between East Coast, West Coast, or whatever. I was like, I'm going to America. I don't know the difference between the different, you know, the different dynamics like Midwest versus East Coast, West Coast. So I filled out that application, and uh, my mom did a fundraiser to raise money for my ticket. I got on a uh, plane. I had one suitcase, $300 in my pocket, and I had to figure it out from there. Wow. So I arrived at uh, UMKC. I had a partial scholarship, like an out-of-state scholarship, but then everything else I had to figure it out. And I had to start working, so I was working um, part-time at school. Well, I was actually working full-time at school. I joined the track team as a manager in order to get another scholarship. So I was working full-time on the scholarship team about 30, 40 hours, and then working 30, 40 hours at, uh, at my job, studying, staying up at night. So I worked my butt off for four years, and I was able to graduate with a business administration degree. Wow, yeah. wow. And mm-hmm. so what, what would you say was the biggest difference um, in being surrounded by Africans mm-hmm. and being surrounded about, around black Americans. So uh, that's that, that was a bit of a culture shock for me, like just coming to the United States, because when I came, I come from a background where education is extremely important. You mm-hmm. know, like your parents are like on you when it comes to education. It's like the number one thing you know, when you, when you do that. And it's all, and it's very competitive. So in Zimbabwe, like education is a competitive sport. The way Americans are competitive with, with sports, Mm -hmm. we're competitive with grades and stuff like that. And when I was actually reading your book, I, I was surprised uh, when I was reading the part where you said like the kids who don't do well in school are the ones that are popular. Yeah. In Zimbabwe, it's the opposite. Like it's the kids who are exceed uh, excelling in class that are the cool kids like right. if you're a teenager you want the guy who's getting straight A's yeah like that's just how it is in Zimbabwe yeah and I'm just gonna just add some clarity for people who are watching this and maybe didn't uh, read my book but I was talking about uh, black Americans mm-hmm. if you do well academically you get made fun of by other black Americans yeah. and you get co- accused of acting white and suddenly you, you, you you're not the cool kids or black Americans because you're not listening to hip-hop music and um, that's very true. And so it's the opposite dynamic. So I would have been cool in Zimbabwe. Yeah, you would have been absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you would have 
been one of the cool kids. So when you uh, when you enter a school in Zimbabwe, like you take an entrance exam, and that entrance entrance exam is going to determine where you what class you fall in. So there's usually like four classes. So there's class A, B, C, and D. So if you're if you do well in your entrance exam, you'll get into A class. You know the ones that do the least well go into D class. So every kid's goal is to be in the A class. Mm-hmm. And when you make it in the A class, you're part of the cool club. Wow. You know that's that's just the way it is. And when you're in the A class, it doesn't mean you have a secured spot. You have to keep your grades high because uh. if you don't, they will move you to class B. And it's quite an embarrassment when that happens. And the kids who are in B are trying to get into A. Right. So you have to keep constantly your a- competing. You're constantly competing. And then also, like when you um, when when you take exams during school, at uh, when when the teacher marks the exams and they put your grades, your grades are posted up for everybody to see. Mm -hmm. So when you go look for your name, you're hoping you're at the top, not at the bottom. There's nothing that gets black liberals more upset with me than when I talk about the success of black immigrants from Africa, academically, in their careers, professionally. I think Nigerian Americans are the most successful immigrant group. And I'm sitting here looking at this going, uh, guys, don't tell me that it's because this country is racist. Right. We've got some culture issues. And I that's why I went into that in my book, because I was like, I know how we treat intelligence, how we treat academic success mm-hmm. amongst um, you know black Americans. And right. it is true that black American students fare better in an all-white classroom than in an mm-hmm. all-black classroom because they're allowed to be smart, you know, right. and they're allowed to try and there's a competitive environment around them. Right. Whereas for whatever reason, amongst black Americans, it's seen as um, a, a betrayal. Wow. You've betrayed your culture because you're talking like the white man. You know what I mean? You're doing yeah. what the white man does. It's, it's similar to that Smithsonian list that they posted of attributes of whiteness, they called it. Oh Being my punctual. Did you see this? Being I saw punctual, that. Like, working I hard. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. So totally different in Africa, which is fascinating. And that's why I was like, I'm just looking at the statistics and something. There's obviously a different mentality in Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, stronger values, family values, educational values values and you come here and you're shocked to see how were you treated um well you know what I was treated really well even by by white and African Americans but I did see that there was a little bit of tension between Mm -hmm. Africans and African Americans Mm -hmm. but um you know I I, treated well I was treated fairly well I mean I I I thought America was a very friendly country when Mm -hmm. I came over here you know like the people are just naturally very friendly. I I don't know if it's a Midwest thing, but it, I think it is a Midwest thing. Actually. Really, it yeah. must be okay. Yeah, <laughs> out so, of New York and LA, so yeah. right, right, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So, so yeah. So now I, I absolutely loved the United States when I came over here. Right. There were a lot of things that were a little bit different from what I was used to. You know, I felt like people were kind of on the same level playing field, no matter what kind of socioeconomic places they came from because Mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe we have a very distinct class system Mm -hmm. you know and it's very hard to move from one class to another like if you're born poor you're probably going to die poor Mm -hmm. and so there's this you know class I'm sure maybe your husband might know it because he's from the UK so the UK has a, a lot of that class thing right and Zimbabwe inherited that so and that's something that is actually inherently amazing about America and right. Americans don't realize it is that you have that you have a chance for upward mobility it exactly. doesn't matter where you start you can finish on top you can move and it's so unique about America and because most Americans don't travel Right. They, they don't understand. They don't understand they how don't unique understand and special it is. Good. Yes. And that is why I think you get so many immigrants coming from Africa who are like, what is wrong with you? Like, right. <laughs> right? Exactly. I can work 10 jobs and move up a, a social class. I'm doing it. Right. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Absolutely. So when did you start kind of, and I don't want to say getting into politics, but you really just started speaking out. Um, you always knew you were conservative. It just aligned with your values. Mm-hmm. Right. And that mm-hmm. was like, this makes sense. Obviously, I'm a conservative. Right. Um, when did you start moving towards deciding to be vocal about your conservative positions? So I actually started, um, I wasn't really vocal to begin with, like in the uh, 24, around the 2014 time when the Tea Party movement was starting to get its legs. I was kind of listening to Ron Paul and I was listening to kind of like the Tea Party type conservatives. And I was like, you know what, they're right. Because the Republican Party, because I did support the Republic, but I started to notice that they weren't really like implementing the, you know, there were a lot of talk, but not no action. So I started kind of getting into Tea Party politics. 
This is in 2014. And then when 2016 came around and we had 17 amazing Republican candidates, I was like, wow, this is the year we're going to get a real conservative. We've got conservatives and Christians running. We've got Ted Cruz. We've got, you know, Marco Rubio. We've got Ben, Dr. Ben Carson. I was like, man, this is awesome. I don't know who to pick. <laughs> and I was paying no attention to Trump. I was just like, this clown. <laughs> He'll be out in no time. <laughs> And then it was when the first debate came with uh, with with Trump. And do you remember Megyn Kelly's first question to him? You've called women fat pigs, and she names off a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff. And everybody's quiet, just thinking, "What what is Trump going to say? Is he going to come out with, like, this politically correct thing? And then he goes, only Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> I was like, that's the guy. That's the guy who's going to take on... Both establishments, the Republican Party, the Re Republican establishment, the Democratic establishment, and then most importantly, the media, because I understood that the media had the minds of the people. Mm. And I felt like we need somebody who is not afraid and is not intimidated by the media to be able to take that on. And from that day on, I've been on the Trump train. So yeah. So you just started yeah. speaking out. I just started speaking out on Twitter. So I actually joined Twitter because I wanted to hear more of what President Trump, uh, well, ah, then so candidate Trump, yeah. yeah. So then I just started tweeting my own thoughts. And then, you know, I wasn't on there to trying to become, you know, get followers or anything. But, you know, just as I started posting and posting content on there. And he started retweeting you and that. Right, right. exactly. <laughs> um, so. so that's very, very interesting. So mm -hmm. you are, are kind of just saying what you believe. How many times have you been called a white supremacist, a racist, oh a self-hating black. And this is incredible because you're from Africa, right? right? So this is the irony of this is like the whole black liberal thing is you took us away from Africa and like, you right. know, and they always try to play the like we're African card, even though they've never been to Africa, have no idea what goes on in Africa, probably couldn't point out on a map. Um, but now they are all about their roots. Now you have a person, perfect, she's <laughs> born in Zimbabwe, <laughs> she lived there for 19 years, she came to this country, she worked hard. You're a racist? A, white, a racist and a white supremacist. Okay. I get that all the time. <laughs> and it's just shocking. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> What do you mean? So it's just ridiculous. I mean, what, what you're seeing, I mean, you see white liberals that call me all kinds of names. I've been called all kinds of names by white liberals mm. because they hate the fact that I don't toe the line of how they think a black person should think. Right. You know, the whole narrative that America's a systematically racist country is a total contradiction to the experience that I've had living in this country. Especially because the person that caused the most harm to your country is a black man. Right, exactly. Right. A black exactly. African man. A black African man. Yeah, and and I, I escaped that situation and came to this country and right. was able to make something of myself. Whereas if I had stayed in my country under a black president, mm. I never would have been who I am today. Right, so it's so. almost like race doesn't matter. It's actually the values and the principles that people are putting into place. What a crazy crazy idea. Right, exactly. And you and I share something in common, so I know that this must be something else you get. Um, we are both in biracial marriages. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you came to this very racist country, America, fell in love with a white man. Yes. Right? <laughs> and you have biracial children. Right. So are your children half oppressed and half privileged? That's what I keep asking myself. <laughs> When you look at them, are you like, is that the little oppressed person in you or the little, the little right. privileged person in you? Exactly. And that's that's the division that we're seeing in this nation is, you know, I when I came over here, uh, I never pictured myself with a white person. So initially when my husband was pursuing me, I kind of thought it was weird. I was I had never like seen myself with with a white man. But uh, and I was actually surprised because in Zimbabwe, you know, we have white people in Zimbabwe, but white people and black people usually don't marry. If you see an interracial couple in Zimbabwe, it's usually a, a white person from outside the country, like from Germany or Sweden or whatever. But like white Zimbabweans and black, they don't ever intermarry. So you never, you know, like thinking of marrying somebody who's white, like never crosses your mind, you know. So when I came over here, I was surprised when like white guys started hitting on me. I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in a racist country. Right? Exactly. <laughs> absolutely. So um, so I uh, I met my husband like within weeks of me moving here, but it took him a year to get a date with me. So wow. we ended up getting it. Uh, African women are tough. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
So after um, after about a, a year, we went on our first date, and uh, I fell in love with him, and we've been together since. We've been uh, together for, what, 16 years now? We've been marrying 13 of those, and we have three kids. So it's wow, been three kids. A, yes. Isn't it interesting, and I always think of this now because obviously I'm pregnant now and going on this journey, but you would think that, you know, the rhetoric that is used is America is racist, and you would think that when people on the left see biracial relationships, they would look at it and say, that's what we're after, right? Where people don't see color, where people love each other, not based on race, and this is beautiful, this is perfect. And yet it's the exact opposite response from these so-called woke liberals who yes. claim to see racism everywhere. Yes. The first thing you get called is a sellout. Right. Right? Exactly. So I get that all the time. You're a sellout if you actually invest in what the people who fought for civil rights wanted, right? They wanted an end um, to miscegenation laws. They wanted to make sure blacks and whites could marry, you know, uh, that was the Loving versus Virginia yes, Supreme Court case. Exactly. And yet these same people that see racism everywhere cannot see or hear it when it's coming out of their mouths. Well, they want to upend all of that. Right. They want to upend because we're moving further and further away from what Martin Luther King said. Right. Now they say that if you don't see color, you're racist. Right. I'm like, that's an inversion of reality. Like, I don't teach my kids to see color. I teach my kids to see the content of somebody's character. Mm -hmm. And that's what it should be. That's what Martin Luther King said. Like, it was actually funny because my, uh, I don't talk about race with my kids because it's not an important thing. It's it's not about yeah. what color you are. It's not about your race. It's about who you really are. So it was funny because um, my kids, they only watch PBS because I don't let them watch a lot of uh, garbage. But now I'm starting to be careful about that. But there was a show that came on. They said, oh, on Friday, we're going to have a family night and we're going to talk about race and racism. And my kids are like, Mommy, they said they're going to talk about race. What What's race and racism? Yeah, isn't you know, that my wonderful? Son, yeah, right. and my kid's, are, you know, he's nine years old. And I'm like, should I even start talking about this conversation? Yeah. You know, so I just, you know, the whole race thing, like seeing color. It's being taught by adults to children. Exactly. And it bothers me. And, and I'll add, when people say, oh, I had to sit down, I had to talk to my child about, uh, you know, and I've seen this a few times. I saw this even if you remove race, when Hillary Clinton lost and people, I had to explain to my daughter, you know, that she could still be something. I'm like, if you, if your daughter ever had her, all of her hopes and futures invested in one woman, you put that energy on your daughter. Right. Exactly. I didn't care about politics at all when I was five years old. Exactly. Why, why would I have boohooed or cried if Al Gore, I, I didn't care about any of that stuff, right? right? Exactly. So it's, it's, you're putting that energy on your children. And it was similar when people kept saying, how did you explain, you know, the George Floyd tape to your, you know, what it was like as a black person watching this and seeing themselves. And I kept saying, I didn't see myself. Right. Um, exactly. I don't have, I don't have interactions, negative interactions with the police. I've never, I've never been to jail. I've never been to prison. I haven't spent multiple stints. So why are you telling me that I need to see myself in every black person? Right. Do you get what I mean? Like, exactly. why would I see, do, do you as a white person see yourself in every white person as right. a Hispanic person? Like, um, does every Hispanic person person go, I see myself in Pablo Escobar. Right. Right. They don't, and th that mindset but only exists for black Americans. It We're only supposed to exists. see ourselves every time a black As person gets black into trouble. Person. And that's another thing that I noticed. The difference between Africans and African Americans is that I've noticed that African, African Americans, the number one thing they see themselves as is being black. Yeah. And that's different from any other race. Like, a lot of people identify with so many things like what they do, where they're from, you know, a lot of things like that. But then the number one identifying factor I've noticed in African-American is I'm black. Like that's the number one thing. Mm -hmm. Like for me, the number one thing in my life that I identify with is my faith in Christ. So I'm a child of God. Like that's the number one thing. And then I'm a wife and then I'm a mother, you know, so, and then race I'm, I'm black. Or I happen to be black. Yes, I always say that I happen exactly. to be black, but I've right. never thought that I had to adjust and have this entire identity and see myself and all these other people because I only, I'm Candace. Right. right? Exactly. And, and it's individualism, yeah, right? Yeah. So what the left is teaching black people is to be collectivist. Mm -hmm. So it's that same narrative, that collectivism. And that's, that, and that's all, yeah, all socialism. That's what it's all about. You need to see yourself and every single other person. And I exactly. just, I, I'm a, a true free market capitalist. I believe in the individual. I believe that I'm, I'm, I don't see, see myself in my sisters. Right. I've got two sisters <laughs> close to nature, the close people to me, and we are so different. Exactly. Um, and we, we make different decisions. We make different choices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's the only way forward 
for all Americans, right? Exactly. Just to realize the importance of individualism, exactly. lest we end up like the Zimbabweans um, who, uh, and by the way, did the media play a big role in the Mugabe thing? Or well, was you it? Know, uh, in Zimbabwe, we only have one channel, oh. one Zimbabwean channel, and it's state-run. Mm. So everybody knows that everything that comes out of that channel is coming directly from the mouth of the of the propaganda. president. So everybody knows it's propaganda. Wow, you guys don't even have a free Not media. really, no. What about like now with YouTube and all this stuff? Is there – like what – I mean, I, I sound so ignorant, but like are you guys able to have – like, could you be Melissa on the right in Zimbabwe? Yes, I could. Yeah, so we we did have other channels, which was mostly like cable. So it would be like American media and whatnot. But I'm saying like the Zimbabwean channel itself. Right. It would be, it's just one channel. And yeah. It's, and it's state run. So everybody knows that what's coming out of there is basically propaganda. And that's right. why I know when I come here and I see a media, I can pick up on the fact that it's, it's propaganda. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Americans don't really understand the fact that our media is not free press. It's right. propaganda for one party. So I picked that up because I, I see, I saw it growing up in yeah. Zimbabwe, just that propaganda that is constant. So, so you're just a lot more awake to it. Yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely. Honestly, I think we just need, we need more black <laughs> Americans to spend time with Africans. Yes. You know, spend time in Africa. I always yes. say if I become president, I'm going to do a trade program. So every black American is like, I hate America. You took us from our, I'm going to be like, we're going to take you right back to your, you're right, we did that. We're wrong. And we're mm-hmm. going to bring you right back to Africa. And we're going to do a swap program. So for, the, for every person that's complaining about America, there's an African that can't wait to get to I'm America. And would you, die for the would, opportunity. There it is would a transform line. America. Yes, it would. In seconds. <laughs> it would. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you have a book coming out. I want to get to this. It is called Choice Privilege. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's it about? Okay. So basically the book is, it says white privilege. And the white is crossed out and I write in choice because really it's about the choices that you make, not the color of your skin that determine how well you do in life. My mother has always taught me that when you make good choices, that is what's going to determine where you go and not the color of your skin. So the book just follows kind of my experience of being black in America, but being a black African in America. So the contradiction, just basically talking about the contradiction of the whole narrative that America is systematically racist and oppressive and the contradiction of the life that I, that I have led, you know, coming from Africa and being black in America. So that's what my book is all about. Well, I hope people go out and buy it. I hope that your platform just gets bigger and bigger and bigger because we need more voices like yours um, because they they really can't strip away your blackness or your identity because you've lived through so much and you've seen so much. Exactly. Um, Melissa, thank you so much for coming on. We wrap every episode by allowing you to leave a two-minute face message for the world. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm going to put you in this direction of the camera and you can say whatever is on your heart and on your mind. Okay. Are you ready? So my two minutes to the world is... uh, Wait, wait, I have to say on your mark, get set. It's my thing. Okay. All right. Okay. (laughs) On your mark, get set, world, I give you Melissa Tate. Thank you. So my two minutes to the world is actually two minutes to the American people because whatever Ameri- whatever happens in America affects the rest of the world. So I wanted, what I wanted to say to the American people is that you have a special country. Your country is amazing. It is great. And it is exceptional. And what we're seeing today with the whole racial narrative is actually a playbook that is being played for Marxism. So I wanted people to understand and recognize that this is a Marxist um takeover that they're trying to destroy the country from within. And as somebody who grew up in a uh, country that went Marxist, I wanted to warn everybody to be able to do whatever it takes to stop what is happening. So I actually brought this. It is a hundred trillion dollar note. And this represents a country that was successful, a capitalist country that I grew up in and I loved, and then a slow walking within 20 years, this is what could have bought you a loaf of bread in Zimbabwe, a hundred trillion dollars. So I am employing the the American people to recognize what is taking place in this nation. I don't want America to take the same path of the place where I escaped. So I would like everybody to recognize the hour that we're in in this nation and realize that we have a choice to make the right decision and to not let America fall the way that every other socialist country has fallen. Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. God bless. 
Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.